Good to uh, see everybody. So glad you are here. I especially want to uh, thank our visitors for being here. Uh, and um, as a way of reminder, we will meet again tomorrow night at 7, so please make your plans to be here, and Wednesday night at 7. We'd love to have everybody back and even more. Before we get into our worship time, just a few announcements that we need to go over. Uh, please keep in mind, of course, the meeting going through Wednesday. Also, our Thursday class, we will meet at 1030 this week, so keep that on your calendars. And then we have a first Sunday coming up June the 2nd, so keep those things uh, on your calendar, please. Also, there are, for the Family Bible Hour time, um, Sundays at 5, there is a schedule out in the foyer if you want to grab one of those and, and keep up with that, uh, what we're going to be doing each week. Uh, that those are available, as I said, in the foyer. In our prayers, um, if you will continue to remember all those that we have listed in our bulletin, if you haven't picked one up already, we do have bulletins out there. Um, please keep those people in your prayers. Did get some good news. Leticia let me know that her um, test came back, all good news. Uh, so we're thankful for that. We can definitely say a prayer of thanksgiving for, for that. Um, please uh, keep that in your prayers as well as the other, um, other things we've been uh, discussing. Tonight, uh, Jacob is here again with us. We're so thankful that he's been here. Yesterday was uh, so challenging and yet encouraging, and uh, really looking forward to it. Uh, as he's mentioned several times, uh, what we've been studying on Sunday and Wednesday, this just really pairs really well with that, and real challenge to, uh, to again, as Christians, reconsider the cross and, and Jesus and and the sacrifice that was paid for us. So we're thankful to have Jacob here as he continues to deliver his mess, God's message to us. If you would, uh, we're going to take just a moment and have prayer together. Brother Ken Sullivan from the Goldsboro Church is here with us. And then Brother Van will come and lead us. And at the conclusion, uh, Gary Singleton, who I can't believe I'm saying this, is the a member at Asheboro Church of Christ is with us. Uh, that seems so strange. Uh, he'll always be a member here as well. Um, so glad you are here. Uh, Ken, if you don't mind leading us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful day. And we thank you for freedom. We thank you for the opportunity to come and study your word together. We appreciate all those that have taken the time to put you first as we study tonight. We ask that you be with Brother Jacob as he speaks, bring to him a ready recollection of all that he has studied, studied, and may we as careful listeners pay attention and write the words on our heart. Go with us as we, as we go through this hour, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Number two, all the way up to number two. I'll put uh, Cole on the uh, sick list. He uh, maybe got a little too hot today at field day at school or something. But uh, he's running a little fever this afternoon, so he's not with us tonight. Number two. <clears throat> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise the Lord, he had not made. 
Let them praise His King Jehovah. They were made at His command. Them forever He established. His victory shall ever stand. From the earth of Mark 9.25. 9.25 will be the song after the lesson. 9.25. Before the lesson, let's sing number 756. 756. I want to be a
All right, man, it is it is good to see y'all. Um, here's what's going to happen when I get back home. There will have been some changes. One of those changes will be manifested when I stand on a bathroom scale, right? I mean, we've been doing, I've been doing some eating, y'all. We ate here yesterday, had a meal, even took some of that home with me. And then I had Turner and Charlene take me out last night to a buffet. There's only, just, just FYI, there's only one kind of food I, I will not eat, and it's Indian food. I don't do it. Um, I, I, did, I go to eat Indian food, and I think what I'm about to put my mouth's warm and it's cold. And then I go to put something in my mouth and think it's going to be cold and it's warm. It's always throwing me off. And I just can't, I can't deal. So you're like, where do I take it? You can take me anywhere but a, an Indian buffet. My brother duped me into going to one one time and it was not a good experience. Uh, and that's not to say you don't like, you might like it, you might love it. Just don't ask me to go along, okay? Uh, but then I uh, got up with Jackie this morning. We, we, had, a, we had a good meal and then... Uh, uh, Hung out uh, tonight at the Cracker Barrel uh, with the lovely couple in the back. Made connections that blew my mind. Uh, they have lived everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Uh, so, and because of that, they've, made, they've met people and known people and run in some circles that I'm aware of. So uh, it's a small world uh, to me. It's so, it's so interesting uh, how small that world can be in the church at least. So yesterday, as you know, for those that were here, um, we started off by thinking about the question, who is Jesus of Nazareth? And we said that, you know, back in the day, people had a lot of thoughts, even back then, as to his identity, what he was about. Um, some people saw him for who he is, some people just didn't get it. And we talked about how people have different thoughts about Jesus today. People... Uh, a lot of people are very patronizing. They, they like to say, well, I think he was a brilliant Jewish rabbi that said some really important things. Uh, but we pointed out that the same Jesus who told you what your relationship to money should look like and what your relationships in general should look like is the same Jesus who claimed to be God. So if he claimed to be God, you got to decide whether he was telling the truth whether he was lying about that or whether he was just profoundly confused, right? But unless you're willing to claim he was Lord, you don't get to call him a good moral teacher and act like we're buddies because we have a very high view, extremely high view of who Jesus is and what he's about, right? Uh, then we took... Um, we took a look, long look at the crucifixion of Jesus. And then in the afternoon session, we revisited that because there are some things. Uh, we, we, we played off of the old Fanny Crosby song, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. And we highlighted how, while that makes all the sense in the world to those of us who are Christians, it is just weird to the people out there. Or like, why would you want to stay near something you know, an instrument of torture and death. Uh, what, what is this? Why do you find such significance in that? And that's what we unpacked yesterday afternoon as to why we would want to stay, stay close to that, right? Well, tonight, we got to talk about something that's equally important. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Paul was standing before Governor Felix, he boldly declared that he had, and I quote, that he had hope toward God that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust. He had hope that one day there was going to be a universal resurrection. And that, by the way, echoes the words of Jesus himself when he said a day's coming where everybody that's in the tombs and the graves are going to come out. Some of them go into resurrection of life. Some of them are going to a resurrection of condemnation. 
that there will be a winnowing, right? That there will be a separation between the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the chaff, whatever imagery you want to use there, right? But that whole talk of resurrection of the just and the unjust is predicated upon another resurrection. Now let me ask you a question. Had anybody been resurrected before Jesus from the dead? Yeah. Right? Okay. So, what makes Jesus' resurrection unique? Well, I'll tell you, yeah. You got it, sister. One of the things that makes Jesus' resurrection unique, there's actually two things. First thing is the most obvious. He is the first one to come back from the dead and not die again. Lazarus, all the others, they came back, but un they had to go through death, unfortunately, a second time. All right, unless you were prepared to say that right now we can get, we can go hang out with Lazarus somewhere, you know, like he just came back and he's still here and he hadn't died. Um, another thing that's interesting about Jesus' resurrection is there was no like human mediator, right? I mean, you go back in the Old Testament, you had Elijah, you had Elisha, they're bringing people back from the dead. Uh, one of my favorite stories, by the way, of a resurrection story is the story of the widow of Nain. And I want to tell it in my, my way of telling it, okay? It's a story that uh, I now find myself using at most funerals that I preach. And since coming back to Lawrenceburg in 2015, so that was in April 2015, I was talking to Brian. Brian will have been here 10 years in January of 2025. Uh, 20, I will have been 10 years in April of 2025 in Lawrenceburg. I've done, since coming back to Lawrenceburg, I've done over 100 funerals in the last 10 years, okay? And I would say 75 to 80% of those funerals are members of the church where I am preaching at. Just an older generation that is passing away. <clears throat> but I like to tell the story of the widow of Nain because in this story, you have this huge crowd of people that are following Jesus and they're going into this town, okay? And there's this other huge crowd of people that is leaving the village and they are led by a widow. So here comes Jesus, and here comes this widow, right? And on the bier behind the widow, you would think, because she's called a widow, you're thinking that must be her husband. But it's not. It's her only child. Now see how doubly tragic this is? She is a widow, and now she is having to put, you know, they're going out to the graveyards where they're headed. And, and they're in this procession. By the way, in that day, if you were in the village and you saw a procession going through town, Unless you had a really good excuse, you were kind of expected to join the procession. Um, do you, how do y'all do it here in North Carolina? I mean, in Tennessee, if there's a procession through the middle of town or on a back road, you pull off on the side of the road and you stop and you wait for them to pass. Maybe y'all have that practice here, that custom here. Okay. Um, I, you do. Yeah, sometimes it's kind of dependent upon the person as to how you, how you deal with that procession. But, but just imagine being in town and here goes, and it was probably a close-knit town and you probably knew everybody that was passing away and so it might have been everybody's on their way out of the village, right? But here's this woman who is, you know, her, um, her son is, has died. And the text says that Jesus had compassion on her, that his heart went out to her. Don't you love that? I mean, it, he, was, he, he was a man, but he was also God. So one of the points I like to make here is that when you lose somebody that you love, do not conclude that God remains unaffected by that or that his heart doesn't go out to you or that he doesn't hate death as much as you do, if not more, right? I mean, Jesus felt felt for this woman and uh, he, uh, he touches the beer risking ceremonial defilement by the way but he effectively stops the funeral procession 
And he tells the woman, do not weep. Now, isn't that funny? You're like, um, I mean, if there was ever a moment when a woman should be weeping and being encouraged to weep, why would you say something like that? I think Jesus said something because he, he, he knew what he was getting ready to do. He tell, he commands the dead boy to rise. What I love, if you read the story there, about a third of the way in Luke 7, the boy actually comes back to life, and you know what he does? He starts talking. I've always wondered, what was he saying? Right? Was he picking up a conversation that he, when he died, he was talking and he's dead, you know, and he comes back and he picks up where he left off, or is he talking about, I don't know, some experience he recalls after being dead? I don't know. But here's the point. Dead people don't talk. If he's talking, he is now very much alive, right? So here's what you got. Almost 2,000 years ago, you had a procession of sorrow and death meet a procession of hope and life. In one procession was a man who had been overcome by death. In the other procession was a man who would overcome death. And when those two processions came together, it erupted in a party. That's what happened. Right? You can imagine the joy that this mother had. I mean, you can imagine how incredible that moment was. And the the hope that we want to say is, I realize that in that moment, what you have is a preview of what is going to happen to everybody in the end. And when I say everybody, I am saying only what Jesus said and what Paul said. Every single person, whether good, bad, or ugly, right, is coming up out of the grave. Why? Because that is how powerful the resurrection of Jesus Christ is. Nobody gets to stay in the grave. However, that doesn't mean that everybody's ending up in the same place when they are resurrected. It all hinges on, obviously, what you think about Jesus, what you think about his crucifixion and death, And whether or not you've concluded that he didn't stay dead, but that he did in fact come back from the dead. He, Paul wrote that he is the first fruits. You know what that means, right? In terms of a harvest, the first fruits are a promise of more to come. Jesus is the first fruits. Everyone else is the harvest to come. Now, I want you to look at this passage. You'll notice that Paul says that he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by what? By his resurrection from the dead. One of the things you have to keep in mind about Jesus is that he predicted his own death and his resurrection prior to it happening, right? I mean, we have evidence. I'll give you one. This is Matthew 17, 22, and 23. He said, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. That is not the only time he would predict that. There would be other predictions. So here's the deal. If Jesus did not come out of his tomb, he would be proven a liar because he did what? He predicted. And if you read carefully Matthew 26, even his opponents heard him say this on occasion. Even they had picked up on the fact that he claimed he would die and he would come back. That's why they said, we need to set a guard at the tomb. Because they thought, you know what the disciples are going to do? They're going to go steal that body and then they're going to claim he came back from the dead just like he said he would. And we're going to prevent that from happening. And so we're going to set what? A guard at the tomb. Y'all need to just go ahead and file that away in your brain right now. Because that's about to come back. Okay? Here's the thing. 
If he did not come out of the tomb, given what he predicted about himself, he could not be God and he could not be our Savior. I mean, that's the thing about this, guys. It's a both and. In other words, we needed the crucifixion and we need the resurrection. If we don't have the crucifixion but we have the resurrection, we're still in trouble. And if we have the crucifixion but he never came back from the dead, we are in trouble. We need both of them. We need his death, the sacrificial death, and we need his resurrection. Absolutely. Christianity's central claim, if he did not come back from the dead, would be found false, and the founder would be a false prophet. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, mark my words, Christianity is nothing but an interesting museum piece. If he did not come back from the dead, the best thing to do with Christianity is just kind of study it as, hey, this was a cool religion at one time, way back when, a very short time. Probably, the sense didn't even really get off the ground if he didn't come back from the dead. But those of us who are Christians, many of you in here tonight, if not all of you, maybe, we are convinced that he did not stay in the tomb. We are convinced that he did come back to life. We are convinced that in coming back to life, that vindicated every single one of Jesus' radical self-claims, about who he was, and it vindicated all of his predictions about what would happen. The New Testament affirms by various testimonies that Jesus did come back from the dead, and I will argue, as we're going to see tonight, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only thing that makes sense of all the known facts. So I told you that tonight I wanted us to play the part of a detective, okay? By the way, this is about the only silhouette of a detective I could find that didn't have like a massive pipe coming out of his mouth, you know? Um, so we're going to be non-smoking detectives tonight. And, um, and we're going to start, we're going to start by thinking about the empty tomb. And, and, and what you're imagining is just imagine uh, that we are, we're living there in the first century. Some way, somehow, we are a collective of detectives who have you know, we've got a pretty good reputation going. And we got some Roman authorities that say, hey, we got an interesting case over here. I'd like to hire you guys to come in and tell us what happened. Like, what do you think happened? We want you to stick around Jerusalem for, for a, a month or two, and we want you to give us your honest conclusion as to what took place on this occasion. Some of you are already like, well, let's go ahead and start with forensics, right? Let's go in there and take the fingerprints, get the DNA, because some of you have been watching CSI and Criminal Minds and all of that stuff. I hear you, but we're just going to use our noggins. We're going to use some facts. We're going to look at theories as to whether or not that really fits the data. We're just going to see, and hopefully by the end of this lesson, if anything, if anything, your faith will be built up where you walk away going this is the only thing that makes sense of what we know about what happened I will tell you that uh, some of you are familiar with the word apologetics I think some of your material you might think of apologetics press some of you are familiar with Kyle Butt and Eric Lyons and some of those guys out of Montgomery um, you know in a lot of Christian evidences and apologetics classes, what you will often do is you will start with, for instance, the existence of God, and you will try to establish that God exists, reason with somebody there. The next thing you'll do is say, well, could this God, could he actually like, you know, if he was going to reveal himself, how would he reveal himself, in what way would he reveal himself? You, you work through that and go, well, it makes sense to get something that's written, that's preservable, that can be looked objective, and we can look propositional, and we can read it, and we can study it, and all of that. And that's where you get off into trying to show that this right here is no ordinary book. By the way, the word Bible just means book. So when you say, hey, I'm going to go get my Bible, what you're saying is I'm going to go get my book. Book with a capital B, right? That's, this is what we're talking about. 
We're saying this is the book of all books, that there's no book like it. And then you will go from there, once you've established the inspiration of the Bible, you will then go to say, okay, now what we want to do is establish that the Jesus that's talked about in this Bible was no mere man, that he was God. Okay? Now some people in apologetics have tried to short-circuit that a little bit. And what they've done, and I'm not saying it's bad, what they've tried to do is they will go, this is just a little presupposition thing here, they will go and try to demonstrate that these documents that we have are historically reliable, that they meet the tests of historicity, so forth and so on, that in fact they can be trusted like other ancient historical documents can be trusted. And then from there, they will start to reason with somebody about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if they can get them to admit, you're right, given the facts of what we know, the only thing that makes sense is that he did not stay dead. Okay? A great book, by the way, not written by a member of the church, but it's a good one. And they come out with a movie at one point. It's just The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. It's kind of a popular level book. But if you want to really dig into the evidence for the resurrection and all of that stuff, it's as good a book as any. It just, I mean, it sends you through all of this stuff. But we're trying to do what? We're trying to just squeeze it all down into one lesson. And so I thought the way we'll do that because we're going to act like detectives. And we're going to start looking at theories. So here's, here's a theory. All right, you're a detective. We're detectives. We walk up. We've got an empty tomb. We were told, as far as we knew, that a man who'd been crucified about three days before, of course, according to Jewish reckoning, that he had succumbed to crucifixion, that he'd been laid in this tomb, and that now he's not there anymore. And one person could argue, and it has been argued, that Jesus... It, some people have called it the swoon theory, all right? And, I, and it's possible that this church has studied all of this in recent days, in fact, okay? That's very possible. That's fine. So just consider this a review, all right? But what, what you got is they, they feel like, okay, what if maybe Jesus passed out on the cross and everyone, everyone thought he was dead? And they began to operate as if he was dead, and then, you know, after they buried him in this cool, dark tomb that, you know, it was a bit refreshing and he revived while he was in the tomb and he got out and then he found his disciples who mistakenly believed that he had come back from the dead. Okay? This is one of the theories that some people hold on to. And one of the reasons they hold on to it is well, I don't want to admit that we have a guy coming back from the dead and the implications of that. So this is as good as any, right? Well, here's the deal. Anyone who witnessed the event or was in any way of involved with the crucifixion, whether leading up to it, the middle of it, and after it, agreed that Jesus died. That would be his loved ones. That would be the Jewish leaders. That would be, in fact, the Roman soldiers. And one of our evidences here is what? If I'm a good detective, I'm going to find out that those trained Roman soldiers, when they got to Jesus, they didn't do something. What did they not do? They didn't break his legs. Now, why is that significant? Because had he still been alive on that cross, they would have done to him what they did to the two guys next to him. They would have broken his legs, preventing him from getting the air that he needed to be able to exhale by pulling himself up on the cross. Right? They didn't break them. Why not? Because they knew he was gone. Pilate. Pilate was surprised by his early death as far as he was concerned. By the way, can I throw something at you to make your brain spin tonight? Um, one writer said, it wasn't so much that Jesus was seized by death. It was that he seized death. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Is it possible that he had authority over when he would die? And if he did, well, you got some questions as to why he stayed on there for six hours and not just one, two, or three. And I will remind you, not long before he died, a Roman centurion came to his senses. 
just throwing that out there for you to think about. Uh, you know, it's a, how, how did he, you know, here, so here this, this tomb, Pilate is surprised that he didn't last longer, that his, they didn't have to break his legs, and he refused to release Jesus' body for burial until he himself was convinced that Jesus had died. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, those guys thought he was dead. In fact, they prepared his body. You think at some point in putting all the linen wraps and spices and all of that, that they would have been like, you know what, brother? I don't think he's dead. Look at him. He's breathing, right? They knew he was dead. And by the way, let's just for argument's sake, Let's just pretend he survived it. Well, how much, how much longer are you going to survive after something like that? No food, no water, no medicinal help, nothing. You're just put into a cup. And how are you getting out of the tightly wrapped bandages? And, and, and in the shape you're in, how are you even going to be able to move that massive stone out of the way? If all this is is a resuscitation and not a resurrection. If all it is is just a resuscitation. Right? How, how are you going to have the energy? I, I'll tell you right now, I had a stomach bug like several months back. Guys, it destroyed me. Like, have you ever been so sick you can't, you can't even hardly walk? And you feel like you're living a double, there's you and then there's this other you that's next to you. It's like your body's not in sync, you know? I want you to imagine if you had been flogged with what they call the verberatio. I mean, this is where they're pulling chunks of your body out of your back, ripping through muscle. I mean, it is that people died from the scourging alone, not just crucifixion. Some people never made it to crucifixion. Or if they did, it was just to put them up there as a spectacle, dead body hanging there, kind of like Esther, you know, where they put you on the gallows. That wasn't the means of execution in Esther's day. That's how they displayed your body after you were dead so that people could gawk at you and make fun of you and, and also kind of go, I don't want to be him, right? So maybe I won't do what he did. I, there's this one German critic. His name is David Strauss. Uh, he observed this. I think it's good. He said, it is impossible that the one who had just come forth from the grave half dead, he's imagining this scenario that he didn't really die, just kind of you know, resuscitated. He goes, it is impossible that one who had just come forth from the grave half dead, who crept about weak and ill, who stood in need of medical treatment, of bandaging, strengthening, and tender care, and who at last succumbed to suffering, could ever have given the disciples the impression that he was the conqueror over death and the grave, that he was, in fact, the prince of life. This lay at the bottom of their future ministry. Such a resuscitation could only have weakened the impression which he had made upon them in life and in death, but could by no possibility have changed their sorrow into enthusiasm or elevated their reverence to worship. In other words, if you have a, a half-dead Jesus coming up out of this thing that is barely hanging on to life, is that going to ignite what we see in the book of Acts? No. If this theory is correct, by the way, then Jesus himself was involved in flagrant lies. His disciples would have believed and would have preached that he was dead and came to life again, and Jesus just didn't have the courage to uh, correct them and say, oh, no, I didn't. You got it wrong. I didn't really die. You know, that never happened. So if I'm a good detective and I got half a brain, I'm going, I, don't, I hear your theory, but I don't like it too much. There's got to be something else. Well, what about this one? Maybe, maybe the, the theory, going theory is, well, maybe this is the wrong tomb. The reason why it's empty is because it's never been filled. They put Jesus in a different tomb and we got the wrong tomb. Maybe Jesus did indeed die but the women as disciples discovered an empty tomb, not because Jesus had been raised from the dead, but because they went to the wrong tomb. 
Another sort of side theory is the idea that Joseph of Arimathea placed Jesus' body in his tomb temporarily due to the lateness of the hour and the closeness of his own family tomb to the site of Jesus' uh, you know, crucifixion. But then he would have come earlier you know, or, or later in the day and maybe would have moved the body from the tomb. He originally laid him in and took him to like the grave for common criminals and thieves. Which, again, even as I say this, you go, that was not Josephus' intention. was just to throw him off in a car. That's why he's giving him his grave to begin with. All right? So let's just, just quickly think about this. Consider Luke 23, 53 through the first part of 24. Then Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation. The Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Question, did the ladies see where they put Jesus? Yes, they did. Oh, let me, let me put this in here for you because I always love this, women. Ladies, I just want to give you a shout out here. Um, one of the reasons why we believe in the historicity of the Gospels is because of the ladies. Here's why. In that day, a woman's testimony, unfortunately, was not admissible in court. So if you are making up a legend that you want people to believe that Jesus came back from the dead, the last people you want being first at the tomb is women. If you're making up a legend, you are going to have good Jewish men show up to the tomb first in order to account for the empty tomb. The fact that the text tells us that it was women who came to the tomb first and all of that underscores the historicity of the text. That there's no agenda here other than to tell what actually happened. And that is Jesus came back from the dead. So there's your little tidbit as to why people believe in the historicity of this text. Because we have women being the first witnesses to, that could testify to the empty tomb. But I want you to notice, they knew where he was laid, and they come back to that tomb the next day. Also, here's a good one. Are we to believe that the Roman guards sealed and guarded the wrong tomb? I told you to file that away in your brains. They were actually told to go seal and guard the tomb. Are we saying they got out there and sealed and guarded the wrong tomb? And by the way, here's another thing. Once Jesus' disciples began preaching, say we were, detectives were hanging around, and these disciples start saying, we have seen the resurrected Jesus. We have seen him alive. Don't you think the Jews would have searched high and low for Jesus' body? And don't you think they would have done everything they could to identify this supposed right tomb and then do what? Parade the dead body of Jesus out in front of everybody and say, listen, don't be listening to these guys anymore. Here is Jesus' body. It is him. Let's stop this foolishness. But that never happened. And I'm going to tell you why. Well, I'm just telling you. I think I already have a suspicion maybe what happened here, right? Uh, here's another thing. What about this? The Romans took the body. Uh, how many of you like good detective shows? Let's just go show of hands. I love the good detective show, man. I love good detectives. I love the way they think, the way they reason, the way that sometimes they're thinking on a plane I'm not even thinking on, and then they blow my minds at the end when they notice something I didn't notice and all of this kind of stuff. But, you know, and I know, I know some of the detective shows get real fantastical, and the stories that sometimes are created, some of which are true, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, but, but here's the thing. Um, one of the things they often have to operate on is this thing called motive, Right? All right, somebody's dead. We need to figure out who did it, who had a motive. You know, for instance, if um, you had this wealthy mogul that's murdered, uh, one of the first questions you're going to ask if you're a good detective is, well, who stood to gain from his death? Because it's possible that the reason he's dead is because somebody wanted what he had, and we're entitled to it, right? So you've got to start thinking motives. You've got to start thinking, okay, well, okay, you're saying that uh, the Romans, maybe the Romans took the body. The next thing you're going to ask is, why? Why would they do that? Would they have a good reason to steal or take the body, to, to rob, rob this grave 
of this body. If the Romans had stolen the body at the behest of Pilate or some other political leader in the area, it seems to me that they would have had good reasons to expose the fraud of those early apostles of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because these apostles start going around telling people, Jesus, the Messiah, has come back from the dead. And everywhere they go, the Jews do what? Cause riots, cause unrest. The last thing a Roman procurator wants going on in his area of control is civil unrest. So if I'm a Roman and I'd said, I'm gonna, we're going to do this, we're going to steal this body, um, let me just tell you, they would have had all the reason in the world to bring that body out at some point and say, hey, hey, the joke's on you. We, we took the body. Here it is. Stop going around telling everybody that Jesus came back from the dead. Please. That's not what happened. Romans had no motive for doing it. Here's a good one. Maybe the Jews took the body. Again, what would the motive be for the Jews taking the body? And I want to remind you, I told you to file this away in your head. Who asked Pilate to set a guard on the tomb? The chief priests and Pharisees did. Now, if you were intending on stealing that body, why? Why would you have the Romans seal it and guard it. Makes no sense. You would not do that. You would not want to make your job of stealing the body more difficult, right? Because here's the thing. You know what happens to grave robbers in the first century? They don't get to see life much longer after they're caught. They are executed. And on top of that, on top of that, the guards that let something like that happen they too are going to be executed. We know that the Jewish leaders were seething with rage. And they did everything possible to prevent the spread of the message about the resurrected Christ. They did everything they could to suppress that message. They even would beat and threaten and imprison the apostles. They even get around to killing some of them, right? Now, you, you tell me, if the Jews took the body and they really don't like this preaching about a resurrected Jesus, what would the Jews have done if they took the body? Like the Romans, they would have brought the body out and said, okay, here it is. The disciples, maybe Jesus' disciples took the body. In fact, if you read there in, uh, and I mentioned this a little earlier, right? If you read down there in Matthew 27, beginning around a verse 62, it says, The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. By the way, this is, this right here, Jesus' disciples took the body. This would have been the theory, the explanation that the Jews would have spread. We have evidence of this in another passage. When they're confronted with the reality that Jesus' body wasn't there, do you know what they said to do? All right, I want you to go out there, and I want you to tell people that the disciples came while the guards were asleep. The disciples came, and they stole the body. That's the message we are going to send to our Jewish brethren. What's funny to me is Matthew never spends one piece of ink. Like, he doesn't even give a letter to refute it. Because I want you to hear again what I just said. For presumably, right, your witness to this would be the Roman guards. Right? Who's going to believe Roman guards when they say, well, here's the thing. We were asleep. 
we were asleep, and the disciples came while we were asleep, and they took the body of Jesus. What would a judge ask? What did you see? What did you hear? What did you sense while you were asleep? Right? They're not awake. How are they going to testify when they weren't even awake? Right? This just doesn't make any sense. But this is the stuff they're spreading. This is the big one right here. Jesus' disciples took the body. So what's the evidence? So if I'm a detective, you better think, who am I going to need to talk to? Well, I'm going to end up talking to the people that said, well, he's, he's, he's alive, right? He's the, I saw him. There is the psychological impossibility. Why is that? If I did some talking and I started asking him, hey, where were you guys when uh, Jesus was in the tomb? Because he was missing. He was in there at Friday night. He's missing by Saturday morning. Where were you guys at? What, what, is, what, do you, what are they going to learn? They were, in a upper, they were in an upper room behind locked doors, scared out of their ever-loving minds. Confused. Psychologically, it doesn't seem like they had what it took to go out there and steal the body. But then this shows my hand a little bit on four of the things we're going to look at. There's also the ethical impossibility. Because here's what you have to understand. These guys are going to eventually leave that upper room. And they're going to go out into the world. And they're going to turn that world upside down. And at the heart of their message is that Jesus did not stay dead. Now, I understand. You know this. I mean, all of us became very aware of this on September 11th, 2001. I remember where I was at. Do you remember where you were at? I remember that day. Unbelievable. We had people that were dying for what they believed to be true. They really did. They sincerely believed it to be true, right? But what you have to explain to me is if the disciples took the body of Jesus and they knew that Jesus did not come back from the dead, why would they die for something that they know is a lie? That makes no sense. See, that's different. You can believe something to be true and be mistaken. That happens. It is very possible to believe a lie. And if you don't believe that's true, you need to go have a conversation with Eve. Right? Eve believed a lie. People believe lies all the time. But what people don't do is act on something, especially heroically, risking their life. If they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that what they're risking their life for is in fact a lie. Did the disciples take the body? There's no way that's true. Not in light of what happened in the days following. So I'm thinking, if I'm a detective, I'm getting there and I'm going, guys, we'd be looking at each other, because this has been a pretty crazy phenomenon. And we'd be like, guys, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Are you thinking this could be what's happened here? That this guy died and came back to life? Four other facts besides the empty tomb, okay? This lesson will be yours. Very quickly. Some of this is kind of recap, but we, we'll, we'll develop a little further. There were multiple people who claimed to have seen Jesus alive and well. Multiple people. It wasn't just one person. It wasn't just two people. Um, they, and they didn't see a re resuscitated Jesus. They saw Jesus that was very much... Uh, very much in tune with his faculties. He's showing up at different, in different situations for different purposes. They occurred from the morning of his alleged resurrection to his alleged ascension 40 days later. Around 10, and if I'm a good detective, I'm going to go around, I'm going to talk to people and be like, so you're saying what? I said, listen, as sure as I'm standing here, I saw him. I saw him. There is around 10 distinct appearances recorded. They show 
great variety as to time, place, and people. Some were to individuals like Peter and James. There were appearances to the disciples as a group. And there was one to 500 assembled Christians. The appearances were at different places. Some were in the garden near the empty tomb. Some were in an upper room. One was on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Some were far away in Galilee, right? Up, up in northern Palestine, away from Jerusalem. The major theory that is advanced to explain away the accounts of these appearances is that they were all hallucinations, okay? This is, in fact, the theory. The prevailing theory, even to this day, when you bring up these appearances, here's the problem. Like, right, if you're a note taker, you're going to want to write this down. A hallucination is not like a cough. It is not contagious. Okay? And here's another thing you write below that. A hallucination is a subjective and very personal experience. So what you would have to explain is, when Jesus showed up to 500 people at the same time, you have got to explain, as a skeptic, how all 500 people at the same time had the same hallucination. I don't care if you gave them all LSD and said, guys, I want you all to now eat this LSD, and I'm hoping every last one of you trips out. They all might trip out, but they are not all going to see the same thing. They are all going to have different experiences. They're going to see different stuff. And whoever wrote a book of what they, what they saw and what they experienced, it would be unbelievable, right? But you do not have this mass hallucination with everybody seeing the same thing at the same time. That's not how hallucinations work. They have never worked that way, and they never will. So if I'm a good detective, and I got half a brain, I'm going to go, they all saw resurrected Jesus Christ. At this point, whatever skepticism I have is starting to really fall apart. Here's another one. Several of the eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection died proclaiming Jesus' resurrection. We've already made this point. People do not die for what they know is a lie. And that just rhymed, and I'm proud of myself. Right? Um, <laughs> but, but right, people don't die for what they know is a lie. They just don't do it. That's not how this works. Here's the third one. Hardened skeptics became staunch believers. I want to give you two cases in point. The first one is James. This is Jesus' half-brother. What do we know about James basically throughout the ministry of Jesus Christ? He did not believe in his brother. James, the half-brother, did not believe in his brother. Um, this to me tells me that Jesus' childhood was basically ordinary. Have you ever wondered what happened to Jesus between being a baby and being uh, 30 years old? We have one story about the childhood of Jesus in the temple at 12 years old. I will tell you there's a book called The Infancy Gospel of Thomas that claims to tell you what happened in Jesus' younger years between his birth and when he showed up at 12 years old in the temple. I will tell you that the book is certainly interesting, but it is a fabrication of the highest sort. Um, it is like Jesus is half child prodigy and I hate to say it Chucky yeah you know Chucky that little devilish little yeah they at one point at one point I'm not kidding at one point a, a a boy bumps into the child Jesus at five years old and he drops dead on the spot on one occasion on one occasion a boy fell from a loft and died Jesus brought him back from the dead, and the reason he did it is he didn't want people thinking he killed the boy. Go read it, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. What I'm telling you is the reason why the gospel writers don't give us a lot of childhood Jesus is because it wasn't anything that was just like mind-blowing. 
It was a normal childhood. I mean, he was growing, developing. Now, we do know he was special. By 12 years old, he is asking questions that is blowing the minds of the rabbis that are questioning him. They cannot, they are, they're like, a kid your age ought not be asking the questions you're asking. And you ought not be able to reason the way that you're reasoning. And he did tell his mom and his daddy, I need to be about my father's business, which tells us at a very early age, he had a pretty good idea of what his identity was. But all of that is a mysterious thing. I mean, we have questions about that. But why I'm telling you all of this is James grew up with him. I want you to imagine, you got brothers and sisters and siblings. I want you to imagine you get old enough and you find out your brother is the son of God. You might struggle to accept that. I mean, talk about one-upping you in the area of sibling rivalry, right? Right? I mean... Here we are. I, 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 James, is, James is thinking he's something, and then it starts getting spread. This Jesus, this, this is your half-brother. He, he's, he's claiming to be the Son of God, and have you seen the stuff that he's doing? You know, are you hearing the stuff that he's saying? I mean, that's the thing. People are as amazed by Jesus, not just for what he did, but by what he said and how he said it. They were like, he is something, right? So, so James, James does not believe but then we also know that James would become an elder in the church at Jerusalem. How does he go from being a skeptic to being a believer and having a book of the Bible named after him? How did that happen? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us Jesus showed up to James after his death. The resurrection changed, changed James. He was never the same after that. All right, here's the second one. You already beat me to this one. I knew him as Saul, and he became Paul. If there was anybody, if there was anybody who was dedicated to the Jewish cause in this world, it was the Apostle Paul. It was Saul of Tarsus. I mean, he was like the golden child of the Jewish establishment. He was the guy. He was the guy they're going to send to do the hard stuff because of his tenacity, because of his zealousness. And then what you've got to figure, what you've got to figure out is how does the persecutor go from that to being the persecuted? How does he, how did, what, it, what accounts for that very dramatic change even while he is going to do what he had been doing so many times before, and that is imprisoning Christians and bringing them back to Jerusalem. How do you explain that change? Well, we don't have to really wonder because Paul tells us. We had the story in Acts 9 when it happened, but in Acts 22 and Acts 26, he tells his own personal testimony. And in both of those, you know what he emphasized? Well, this is my paraphrase. Well, things changed whenever I saw the risen Christ. Or I talked to the risen Christ. That's when things changed for me. I was never the same after that. I couldn't ignore what I saw. I couldn't ignore what I heard. One last one. This is one that gets me. Um, the overwhelming majority of early converts to, to Christianity were Jews in Jerusalem. This is why this is so significant. Um, two things. Number one, uh, it wasn't like whenever Jesus came back from the dead that the disciples went to Egypt and then, or went to, you know, went way up the coast to Antioch of Syria at that point, right? Or, or took a big trip over to Spain. Where did they start their preaching? They took... They started their preaching in the very city where all of this stuff took place. And who were the early converts? They were, in fact, Jews. Well, what is a good Jew? What has a good Jew been doing his whole life? Well, a good Jew loved Moses and Abraham. A good Jew kept that Sabbath every Saturday. A good Jew made sure those sacrifices got done for his sins and the sins of his family. A good Jew kept kosher. How do you explain? How do you explain 
all of these Jews abandoning to a greater or lesser extent their prized traditions. No longer were they meeting and keeping the Sabbath on Saturday. They were meeting on the first day of the week, the day of resurrection, to remember their risen Lord and Messiah. How do you account by Acts 4, there are 5,000 Jews that say, I cannot deny that he died and was come, risen from the dead. I can't deny it. And I will follow you. And people, we have priests. We have priest guys that are coming to, to the faith. They, they started this thing in the very place where all of this stuff happened. Right? That's not to say everybody believed. It's not to say that people didn't remain skeptical and things like that. But, I mean, this started a movement that literally, by Acts 17, had turned the world upside down. And at the center of that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, um, one last passage. Let's just close. And I know we're 10 minutes over that 8 o'clock mark. Some of you hate me for it. Some of you are trying to figure out how much you hate me. But here's the deal. All right? If the resurrection of Christ is not a literal fact of history, here's the deal. The apostles wasted their time with preaching. All Christian faith is futile. It's in vain. If Jesus did not come back from the dead, our loved ones will never be raised from the dead. The text says that if he didn't come back, they have perished. I told, I think some of you, I told, uh, uh, I think Turner and Charlene, and I told, I think Jackie, but here, here's the thing. In August 31st, 2023, so this has been, um, you know, it's hard to believe that we're about three months away from a year. But I was sitting at home getting ready to work on a sermon. I got a phone call from one of the members at my church. And she said, Jacob, um, there's, the call just came over the CB radio. Her husband's a fire investigator, and he keeps tabs on stuff. And he, he said, hey, um, the, uh, there's been a motorcycle accident, and I, just, I was wanting to know what your dad's uh, birth date was. Is the birth date September 12th, 1953? I said, that's, that's my dad's birthday. What's going on, Sandy? Right? And they said, she goes, well, I, th I think you need to get to the hospital. Like, you got to get there now. So I said, okay. And I'm, sh you know how, if you've ever been in a situation like that, you know how your body just starts feeling weird and you start shaking? And you get a lump in your throat, and you're like, something's, something's wrong. The world, something is wrong right now, right? So I go to, I go there, and I'm there for probably 35, 40 minutes before I talk to anybody. By this point, to anybody in the medical staff, whatever. I, by this point, my mom's there. My, my, uh, my wife is there. Uh, my kids are with another family, my youth minister's family. They're kind of keeping them there. and I'm, uh, All of my elders have come. Pretty much the whole deaconship is there. I mean, we have got the waiting room completely full. The doctor comes in, sits down, and says, I, I, there's, there's, no way, there's no good way to say this, but your father is gone. And there was one eyewitness. She was driving this way as he was driving this way. He'd gone to Fred Hardeman University that day to take back a $10 pair of sandals to, uh, to our youth intern that we had had over the summer that his sister had left on a visit, something like that. He was 20 minutes from home, and according to her, the, the wheel, like his, his tire, his front tire just started wobbling like this right here, as if, as if he had had a medical event, had let tension off the handlebars. And you know, after a while, at a certain speed, that goes, and then he tore off to the, to the embankment on the right, um, and I mean, that bike flipped several times. But within five minutes, guys, the EMS was there, and he was already gone. And they could not bring him back. He was 69 years old. He was my babysitter. If I needed anybody at any time to take care of my kids, he never, I mean, I repeat, never said no. 
and I was crushed. My mama, I, I had never seen my mama cry like that. My wife, I remember sitting at home three hours later, holding my kids, trying to explain to them that their granddaddy, we, you know what we called him? Cool Pops. That was his name, the Cool Pops. I had to explain to him that he's gone. This text says that if he did not come back from the dead, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Do you know what that means? Do you understand what that's saying? That's saying that if Jesus did not come back from the dead, you have no hope of ever seeing any of your loved ones again. They are gone. Gone forever. But verse 20 starts with the adversative but, B-U-T. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That means that if I fall asleep in Jesus, because I have every confidence my daddy did, I'm going to see him again. And I guess that's why I get so confused as to why anybody thinks Christianity is a bad idea. Right? It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, give me three good reasons why you think Christianity is just terrible. Because this hope right here, you know, I told you yesterday, for those of you who were here, I told you that one of the things that makes Christianity unique among all the religions of the world is grace. And that's true. But there's also something else that Christianity's got going for it that no other world religion on the face of this planet has. You know what that is? An empty tomb. Not a founder of any world religion. Every one of their tombs are still occupied. The founder of Christianity, he didn't stay dead. He came back. And he's alive. He's alive right now. And it has the power, resurrection of Jesus has the power to make you sure. It has the power to make you new. And it has the power to make you strong. Very strong. Even in the face of death. So this evening... Perhaps we need to pray with you or for you. Or perhaps you have not become a follower of Jesus Christ, the one who died and was raised for you. We are ready, ready to accommodate you. You come with a heart full of faith. You come penitent of your sins. You come willing to confess that he is everything he claimed to be and to reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You will arise to walk in a newness of life. Uh, you get, it's really cool. You get a new family. And this is a good family here, right? You get a, you get a new master. Uh, you get a new focus, a new purpose. You get a new destiny. And tomorrow night, we're going to talk about the return of Jesus. And then Wednesday night, we're going to talk about heaven. Maybe in a way you never really focused on it before, okay? So um, if we can help you in any way, come now together, we stand and sing. 925. 925. <laughs> I am resolved no longer to linger.
Thank you so much, Jacob. For that message, I am. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is a passage I like to spend some time concentrating on, and I, I think it's so powerful. Um, you know, we have hope because he was not found there, because that tomb was empty. I uh, thank you for that, and, and thank you for reminding us of the anchor of our faith. Uh, I did fail to mention earlier, I want to make sure I say it, uh, Roger Melinda uh, let me know, let us know a few minutes ago before services that uh, Hannah is being induced currently. So we're waiting on a phone call. Uh, we're expecting Rebecca any time now uh, to, to uh, join our, our world. And so let's, uh, let's, in our prayer, let's say a special prayer for Andy and Hannah and, and Rebecca and for Roger and Melinda because I know they've got uh, yeah. things dancing in their minds right now. Again, thank you so much for being here. You want to be back tomorrow. I know you're already going to make your plans to do that, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. Gary. Would you pray with me? Our God and our Father, we come before you to thank you, Father, for this opportunity you give us that we can come together and look at the, the proofs. The Bible gives us our proofs, all the proofs we need that you did arise again, that you're the one that we have to know and we have to believe in and we have to follow and Father, we thank you for the message he's brought us. And Father, we're just grateful for the time we have that we can come together and spend with family. And it's wonderful just to be back home again. And I just want these people here to know how much we miss them. And Father, we raise Andy and Hannah to you and the baby. Father, we know that you're the great physician. You know, we know you're in charge of each and everything. And Father, we pray that your will be done in this situation. I pray that you'd comfort Andy and Hannah in this, and as well as Roger, Melinda, and the rest of the family, and that you may have a beautiful grandchild because there's nothing on earth like them. And we just pray that they'd have a, a safe birth. And Father, we just pray that as we part this building and go our several ways, that you be with each one of us, that we can gather again. We ask his prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.